All right, and we're back after the music. I hope everyone's having a great time. Uh, so today uh, we come to the uh, last session of this week, but I believe it will be a very interesting topic because actually from this morning, I saw a lot of questions about chronic pain. So yeah, we have two experts in this field. So I hope uh, they can answer some of the questions uh, related to chronic pain. Uh, so for today, uh, for this afternoon, we will have uh, Dr. Alphan from Turkey. Uh, she will discuss about treatment for cancer pain. And the second speaker is Professor Eric Bushel from the Switzerland. Uh, he will uh, discuss about the spinal cord stimulation for the treatment of neuropathic and ischemic pain. As for the session, it will be led by Dr. Dwi Pancha Wibo. I think I don't have to introduce him because he's very famous. No. <laughs> okay, Dr. Pancha, please. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Krisha and all the Indo Anesthesia Committee, Dr. Susilo, Dr. Edi, and everybody. And I, I, I uh, saw uh, uh, Dr. Janice Melik also, also here. And thank you, Professor Elvan and Professor. Uh, Eric Busher. Uh, thank you everybody for joining this uh, last session, but this is, uh, I think this is a very important part, uh, especially who, uh, for us who deal with the chronic pain because uh, two difficult problem, it is a uh, uh, cancer pain and an uncontrolled chronic pain, back pain that we should, uh, we need to understand. Okay, uh, the first speaker will be Professor Elfan Erhan from Turkey. Uh, uh, okay, uh, sorry. Professor Elfan Erhan, uh, she's from uh, AG University. I, yeah. I is still there, <laughs> Professor Elfan, yeah. because I got the, 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 the previous uh, data. So, uh, yeah, she's a fellow of intervention pain practitioner and wrote a lot of uh, paper that I already <laughs> uh, <laughs> read it you. and learned from you. And you. so uh, no further, further uh, time, I, I give the time for you. Please uh, Thank you. have your time to present. Thank you. Uh, can you see the screen? Yes. Yes, yes, ma'am. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, all of you, especially Susilo and uh, the Indo Anesthesia team for inviting me to this distinguished Congress. It has always been a great honor and pleasure for me to participate in this uh, Congress and be a part of the Indo Anesthesia family. Today, I will be talking about treatment of cancer pain. As we all know, cancer is the leading cause of morbidity and mortality worldwide, uh, more than 18 million cases per year and more than 9 uh, million deaths per year. And pain is the commonest symptom of all cancer at diagnosis and rises in prevalence throughout and beyond cancer treatment. Pain is experienced by half of the patients undergoing the treatment and more than 60% of patients who have advanced uh, or terminal disease. Uh, we know that approximately 80% of people dying from cancer experience moderate to severe pain lasting more than three months. And because of the uh, advancements in treatments, about 40% of cancer survivors whose treatment is complete can uh, have chronic pain. Uh, the type of the pain depends on the uh, diagnosis and it can be nociceptive and neuropathic. And recently, uh, the chronic cancer related pain has been defined in the IASP classification. And accordingly, chronic cancer related pain is defined as chronic pain caused by the pri primary, the cancer itself, its metastasis, or its treatment, chronic post cancer treatment pain. And here you can see the new classification. On the left side, you, we have chronic cancer pain, uh, whether it's visceral, bone, or neuropathic in origin, or we can have uh, chronic uh, post-cancer treatment pain because of the surgery, radiotherapy, or chemotherapeutic agents. Uh, 
The chronic visceral cancer pain is caused by the primary tumor or the metastasis in the, or can be in uh, all of the body and it's often poorly localized and may present as referred pain. And the mechanisms include compression, distension, inflammation and ischemia. It can be continuous or maybe episodic, particularly if it's associated with organ dis uh, distension. The chronic bone cancer pain is the most common type of ca chronic cancer pain. The metastasis from other cancer sites are the most common form because the primary tum bone tumors are rare. And the most common sites are vertebra, pelvis, long bones, and a bone metastasis can uh, weaken the bone and result a pathologic fracture, which can cause a severe pain for the patient. Uh, the neuro chronic neuropathic cancer pain is caused by a tumor or a metastasis damaging or injuring the peripheral or central nervous system. The pain is typically perceived in the distribution of the affected nerves and neuropathic mechanisms are associated with poorer outcomes in uh, cancer pain. So it's very important to identify the neuropathic mechanism to guide the use of additional analgesic treatment. There are also other chronic cancer pains like painful soft tissue invasion by tumor or painful lymph node metastasis. So uh, according to the classification, these are classified like uh, in this uh, special group. For chronic post-cancer treatment pain, it can be uh, caused by uh, disease-modifying anti-cancer treatments, including the chemotherapy, hormonal th therapy, or uh, biological therapies. And uh, we can see chronic painful chemotherapy-induced polyneuropathy in most of the patients, because here uh, you can see that it affects about 60% of patients three months after the treatment with some chemotherapeutic agents. So it can manifest in hands, feet, sometimes face, and can have a glove and stock, uh, stocking distribution. Another cause can be uh, uh, another cause is uh, the radiotherapy, and uh, it can be caused by local damage to the nervous system, bones, or other tissues. It's rare, but can be is, can start within a few months or several years later, uh, and uh, it's about two percent of breast cancer survivors, and up to fifteen percent of head and neck cancer uh, survivors can experience this kind of pain. Uh, radio therapy can also induce a painful radiation induced neuropathy which can occur several years after the therapy and unfortunately pro progressive and irreversible. Uh, where, uh, there are some post-surgical chronic pains as we all know as anesthesiologists it's, uh, it's chronic post-cancer surgery pain common after lung cancer or breast cancer. And we know that these uh, two operations can have long post-surgical uh, chronic pain, which can be after mastectomy, up to 60% of women reporting persistent pain. And after thoracotomy, about 30 to 40 percent reporting pain three years after the surgery. And uh, the, the mechanism of this post-surgical pain is likely to be neuropathic in origin. So as we can understand, the neurophysiology of cancer pain is complex. So knowledge of the mechanisms will lead to the best management. Cancer patients can report in pain in different anatomical sites caused by the cancer, the treatment, as well as the debility and concurrent, dis uh, concurrent disorders. So the effective treatment plan involves identifying the pain generator by history, physical examination, laboratory tests and imaging studies, and applying the appropriate measures. The goal of pain management is to relieve pain to a level that allows acceptable quality quality of life. So to accomplish this goal, we have to have pharmacological as well as other non-pharmacological measures, including psychological, physiotherapic, and social interventions. Providing an explanation for the uh, uh, patient is very crucial. We should discuss the cause of the pain, the treatment modalities, medications, and side effects. Raising the pain threshold and modifying lifestyle, the pathological process, and pain percep perception are all very important because we know that good disease control usually results good symptom control. 
and always providing a psychological intervention whenever needed is very important. The WHO uh, World Health Organization uh, analgesic letter uh, uh, has some principles. Uh, the, by the mouth, we should always uh, try uh, oral pre pre preparations in the first hand. We should give them in by the clock uh, to have a stable uh, blood uh, level and by the letter according to the guidelines and individualized to the patient and attention to detail. Here on the right side, you see the 1986 World uh, Health Organization uh, analgesic letter in step one, non-opioids for mild pain, step two for weak opioids, and step three for strong opioids. However, this approach may have limitations in the context of longer and uh, life and increasing disease uh, complexity. And we know that up to 30% of patients can report inadequate analgesia because they cannot take, uh, take the systemic opioids uh, adequately or cannot tolerate their side effects. So there, at that time, they often require interventional pain procedures involving the blocks, the neurolytic procedures, the infusions, neurostimulation, and radiofrequency techniques. Uh, patients with moderate to severe pain should not uh, progress, should not stay in the steps one by one, but should commence on a strong opioid immediately rather than progress through earlier steps. And each step, other approaches to pain management can be used, including the conalgesics, nerve blocks, and non-drug measures. These are the important modifications of the first uh, who analgesic ladder. Uh, Accordingly, uh, whenever, it's, uh, whenever it's needed, the psychological therapies, the physio physiotherapy, the non-pharmacological modalities, as well as the interventional techniques should be in the multimodal, multidisciplinary uh, team for uh, the uh, benefit of the patient. In 2012, uh, the um, European Association for Palliative Care has uh, reported uh, the evidence-based recommendations for these patients. And they, accordingly, they uh, offer uh, using low dose of a step three opioid, uh, morphine or oxycodone as a, a step two. Uh, because instead of codeine or tramadol. It uh, permits a weak recommendation, but uh, the, in patients with cancer pain that doesn't respond to an initial step, it should be progressed to the uh, next step. And here you can see that the step two opioids for moderate uh, to cancer pain uh, is uh, listed. Uh, we can use tramadol up to 40 milligrams per day, but instead, or put in up to 360 milligrams per day, but um, in an alternatively, morphine in low doses up to 30 milligrams per day or oxycodone up to 20 milligrams per day can be used as step two opioid, uh, as you can see when used at low doses. Another recommendation is uh, there are no important differences between morphine, hydro, oxycodone, uh, and other step three uh, strong opioids given by the oral load. Uh, and any of these drugs can be the first choice step three for the individual patient. Transdermal fentanyl and buprenorphine are alternatives for those patients who are unable to sw uh, swallow they are because they are effective and non-invasive uh, for the opioid delivery. And uh, in the in uh, one, uh, 2018, uh, the European Society for Medical Oncologists uh, published their clinical practice guidelines, and uh, they especially uh, uh, report that the intensity of pain and treatment outcomes should be assessed regularly and consistently using valid uh, to valid uh, options. And uh, we should, uh, patients should be informed about the pain and pain management and the onset of pain should be prevented by around the clock administration and analgesics for chronic pain should be pres prescribed on a regular basis, not as required schedule. And the oral route for administration of analgesics should be advocated as the first choice. 
As we said before, treatment of mild pain uh, with, with step two or low dose step three analgesics. And for mild to moderate pain, uh, there are uh, there is no evidence to increase in evidence from the use of low strong opioids instead of standard step two approaches. And here you can see that strong opioids, there are relative potency ratio between oral to intravenous morphine. And we know that fentanyl and buprenorphine are the safest opioids for the chronic kidney disease. And all uh, a different opioids should be considered in the absence of adequate analgesia and in the presence of opioid side effects. For morphine, the subcutaneous route is the simple and effective one, and IV infusion should be considered when there are uh, uh, contraindications to subcutaneous administration like edema or coagulation disorders, and IV administration is the option only when rapid pain control is needed. Uh, the individual titration is very important, the, and management of the side effects are very crucial because uh, the, the patients cannot uh, use uh, these drugs appropriately, whether they are uh, in, uh, confronting with the side effects. So the constipation, the nausea and vomiting, uh, they are all uh, should be controlled with proper agents, including laxatives or antiemetic agents. And for breakthrough cancer pain, immediate released opioids or transmucosal fentanyl form, for, uh, formulations or subcutaneous morphine can all be applied uh, depending on the country's availability. And for bone pain, all patients with painful bone metastasis should be offered a radiotherapy. Uh, and according to this uh, recent guideline, a single dose uh, can be uh, offered. We, uh, as uh, you remember the classification for cancer-related neuropathic pain, uh, it can be treated using not only opioid combinations, but also tricyclics, anticonvulsants, and uh, uh, gabapentin, pregabalin, duloxetin, or tricyclic uh, uh, like amitriptylin are strongly recommended for this. Uh, and there is a lack of evidence to support routine use of ketamine in these patients, but it can be used intravenously in selected, very intractable uh, cases. And for invasive management of refra refractory pain, I will be talking about them uh, in the few uh, minutes. Uh, there are lots of uh, treatment modalities, interventions, which we as algologs can uh, uh, perform for those patients. The important thing is reassessing the pain at each step and evaluating uh, not only the pain relief, but the quality of life, the side effects, and uh, the presence of comorbidities, the functional status, and other uh, questions in the patients. Uh, asking the questions are very important so that the patients can cooperate with the therapy effectively. Uh, this is very important. Uh, objective measures. You can use one of those uh, scales. They are all uh, frequently used pain assessment tools. It's very important because uh, going through the steps, we need to um, evaluate the pain objectively with some objective tools so that we can go further uh, from mild to moderate pain for weak opioids to strong opioids. And if they are not uh, effective, then switching the opioid from one to another all uh, depends on the severity of pain. And the relative analgesic ratios for opioid switching are uh, reported in different uh, articles. And uh, when switching from one opioid to, to another, it's very important to uh, use a lower dose and uh, carefully uh, watch the side effects. And for those patients who are not responsive to opioids or who are very uh, in a condition that side, side effects preclude their use of opioids, then uh, interventions uh, uh, should be performed. And uh, selecting the uh, procedure uh, needs to uh, know about the patient, the life expectancy, to use a, a simple method or to use a complicated uh, pump. It all depends on the individual patient.
The former who cancer pain guidelines and some other uh, recommendations set a global standard for the pain management, but they are all up to uh, change. And, uh, in, uh, to, uh, not, and in 2018, the new guidelines on cancer pain management uh, was published in Gene Geneva, and it aimed to improve the clinical practice and to facilitate the removal of barriers to adequate pain relief. And here you can see the um, uh, first line drugs, as well as the mostly free, uh, the frequently used morphine, fentanyl, and amitriptyline as an adjuvant for the typical starting dose and special precautions uh, from this uh, guideline. And here you also see the approximate potency of opioids relative to morphine and uh, the comparative doses of uh, morphine and transdermal fentanyl uh, according to this guideline. The opioid agent selection should be individualized for each patient for the, uh, because the variation of the pain presentations and coexisting medical comorbidities. Morphine and codeine should not be uh, used for advanced uh, kidney disease. And in that time, fentanyl appears to be a safer option. And we know that liver function plays a ro key role because of the transformation and metabolization of the opioid medications. So the dosing, uh, and opioid selection uh, should carefully be reviewed in each patient with a liver dysfunction. The codeine should be avoided and uh, certain uh, long-acting opioids with known immune suppressive properties have found to have increased infections in a recent trial. So uh, those um, new uh, literature can uh, help us guide uh, the therapy for each individual patient. And the choice of the opioid might also be limited by the insurance coverance or the availability of these drugs within the country. Uh, codeine, morphine, fentanyl, and methadone are the opioids listed on the WHO uh, essential drug list and might be more accessible compared to the newer options like buprenorphine transdermal. Uh, here you say, again, the adult cancer pain uh, for oral and parenteral opioid equivalents and relative potency of drugs as compared with morphine. There is a strong uh, cautious uh, for this, not recommended uh, opioid is meperidine. Uh, it's not recommended for cancer pain management because of a central nervous system toxic metabolite, which is known as normeperidine. We also don't use uh, meperidine in our daily practice, uh, we, whenever an intravenous formula is needed, morphine subcutaneous is the uh, agent of choice. Uh, here you see uh, the adjuvant analgesics, uh, the daily recommended doses and indications, neuropathic pain for uh, the antidepressants, the anticonvulsants can be used for corticosteroids. There are some indications for neuropathic pain or spinal cord compression. The lidocaine can be given bolus uh, in some uh, patients selected patients for intractable pain, and ketamine has been uh, used some in some uh, patients. And uh, the osteoclast inhibitors are uh, used for the uh, osteolytic bone pain uh, to prevent uh, pathological fractures. Uh, for the international management of cancer-associated pain, the American Society of Pain and Neuroscience uh, published the best practices and guidelines recently. And uh, accordingly, the interventional management of cancer pain shouldn't substitute for oral modalities, but improve the pain relief and allow the reduction in systemic side effects. So where applied appropriately and carefully uh, at the right time, these can contribute to enhance pain relief, reduction of medication use, and improved quality of life. But the knowledge of the disease process, the prognosis, the expectations uh, of the patient are all very important. The likely benefits and possible risks have to be compared with the pharmacological management. And for each intervention, the safety, aftercare, and management of possible complications have to be considered before decision making. 
uh, comparing the interventional techniques, we have non-destructive procedures and destructive procedures. The non-destructive procedures are the nerve blocks or modulating by reversible agents. It can be local anesthetics, bolus injection, the catheters, the pulse radio frequency for peripheral or autonomic nerves. We can also use neuroaxial te techniques. I think it's also a uh, the topic of another uh, session uh, where we use opioids to supplement the local anesthetics and clonidin. The destructive procedures include the chemical agents like alcohol and phenol and physical methods, including radiotherapy, including radiofrequency and surgery. For these uh, techniques, the, some, there, there are some general principles. The pain must be carefully assessed. The, it, it should be the uh, pluses and minuses of each intervention should be carefully explained. Nerve blocks must not cause functional deficits. They should not be regarded as a treatment in, uh, in isolation, but a strategy. And it shouldn't be left as a last resort because at that time, the patient is too ill to tolerate the technique or come to the hospital for the procedure. There are the indications, the pain despite optimal treatment, limited time for oral drug titration, there are somatic pain to few dermatomes, the unilateral pain, the autonomic involvement, and effective oral analgesia but intolerable side effects. The contraindications for the intervention techniques, some of them are the same for regional anesthesia, the coagulopathy, risk of infection, spinal cord compression or raised intracranial pressure for neuroaxial techniques, respiratory insufficiency for cordotomy, and of course, lack of capacity to make an informed consent. The sympathetic blocks are, uh, ha has a long history, as you can see, dating back to 19... Uh, the, the 1908 by Sluder. And uh, you can see that neurologic sympathetic blocks uh, are for patients with refractory melon pain. And um, they, however, the improved technology and non destructive analgesic interventions reduce the use of neurolytic uh, procedures. However, they also uh, continue to play an important role for the refractory cancer patients. Uh, here you see the levels of sympathetic block with major clinical uses. Uh, Stellar ganglion block for cancer pain and pan caused head and cervical region. Uh, I'm not going to go in detail with the technique, but uh, we perform it under fluoroscopy. You, we can have a local anesthetic, phenol, or radiofrequency thermocoagulation, which is the safest option. There are complications because of the uh, organs near the uh, ganglion. And uh, for thoracic sympathetic uh, block, uh, it can be a thoracic uh, postherpetic neuralgia as well as an esophagus uh, cancer. Uh, we also use, uh, we perform all these techniques under fluoroscopy. Uh, radiofrequency lesioning is again safer compared to uh, the neurolytic agents. Uh, Splachnic block, uh, uh, the technique, uh, you can see the neurolytic block or radiofrequency again. And for Choliac uh, block, uh, these are uh, indicated for pain originating from pancreas, liver, uh, stomach uh, to transverse portion of the large colon. Uh, on the right side, you can see the complications. So each uh, patient should be evaluated at the pluses and minuses of the, uh, for the each individual uh, intervention. Uh, there are some uh, different techniques, uh, two needle technique, trans aortic technique, uh, depending on the uh, clinician's uh, preference. And superior hypogastric plexus block for uh, the pelvic cancers, especially the cervix, the rectum, the colon cancer, and the ganglion in part for tenesmus, especially in the perineal region. Uh, for these blocks, uh, again, a uh, lidocaine followed by uh, a neurolytic agent, agent can be performed. And the nearly published uh, best practices and guidelines all uh, advocate or all um, see, as you can see, uh, the, these uh, blocks for abdominal cancer pain, they should be performed for these intractable cancer pain uh, patients. Uh, considering the intraspinal analgesia, 
uh, it's more effective than conventional medical management and uh, se several delivery systems and catheters are available depending on the patient's life expectancy. It can be an epidural or a sporachnoid drug delivery system uh, depending on uh, the patient's needs. Uh, here you see the, uh, the intraspinal uh, analgesia for uh, epidural port. The simplest is a tunneled epidural catheter, but it can be connected with a port for longer periods of use. And this is a pump. Uh, it's not uh, used for uh, patients with uh, short life expectancy because it's more expensive. Uh, so uh, each patient should be considered individually. Uh, the pumps include a battery powered programmable uh, device and infusion rate could be tailored to the patient's needs depending on the activity level. The percutaneous chordotomy uh, is the uh, interruption of the spinal uh, spinothalamic tract uh, for unilateral cancer pain. It's among the most useful procedures with patients unilateral uh, cancer pain not adequately treated by other treatment methods, modalities. An adequate level are found in more than 90% of patients at the discharge from the hospital and a bilateral chordotomies may be required and a contralateral procedure can be performed after a one week uh, period. Here you see uh, the needle is introduced in the neck between C1 and 2 on the contralateral side. And uh, the after passing the dura, the contrast medium is injected and it is directed to the anterior portion of the spinal cord and stimulated uh, for sensory and motor responses. Then a thermocouple monitored lesion is made using a temperature of 80 degrees, uh, 10 seconds followed by 20 and 30 seconds. Uh, and here is our report about the bilateral use of percutaneous chordotomy for cancer pain. Uh, it can be uh, the second side appears to be uh, the success of the second side appears to be similar to the first side with low complication uh, rates for both procedures. Uh, there are also vertebroplasties or kyphoplasties kyphop for vertebral metastasis. And uh, according to the uh, newly published guidelines, the interticular dr drug delivery is an, uh, is, should be considered in patients with cancer-related pain, not responsive to conventional methods. Chordotomy is used for unilateral cancer pain and vertebral augmentation is strongly considered for patients with symptomatic vertebral fractures. Uh, there are also radiofrequency lesioning and nerve blocks for uh, specific uh, peripheral nerves. Those blocks using corticosteroid or radiofrequency lesioning to a peripheral nerve can be considered. Uh, spinal cord stimulation may also be considered in patients with refractory pain. And the next speaker, uh, Eric, will be talking about it. Uh, the, pa the cancer patients, uh, because of their longer survival, may need other treatment options uh, considering neuropathic pain. So uh, sp a spinal cord stimulation may be an alternative for these intractable uh, patients. However, in our country, in Turkey, uh, for spinal cord stimulation, uh, the government only pays for uh, non-malignant pain uh, in our patient population, but uh, for other uh, purposes uh, throughout uh, worldwide, I'm sure spinal cord stimulation uh, lots of patients can benefit from spinal cord stimulation for the intractable cancer pain uh, during their lifetime. So uh, the transition from the original uh, three-step analgesic ladder to the revived four-step, including the invasive and minimally invasive treatment options, this is the addition of this fourth step is an interventional step and includes all these uh, techniques. Uh, but uh, recently, uh, a, a, a bi-directional approach has been uh, uh, suggested because uh, the pain intensity is the most important thing. So uh, it is not always going upward. Sometimes it needs to be going uh, downward. So it uh, should be um, decided depending on the patient. And in all, 
In each situation, the combination of pharmacological and non-pharmacological strategies, according to the physiology, physiopathology of pain, the pain features, the complexity of symptoms, the morbidity, comorbidities, and psychosocial factors are crucial. Let's apologize so, for of elephant. Uh, time is yeah. Five. It's my okay. last okay. slide. Oh, okay. Okay. Good. <laughs> it's my last slide. So. Uh, to sum up uh, the treatment of cancer-related pain, uh, cancer pain is a unique experience and treatment plans need to be individualized, tailored uh, to address the changing clinical needs of the patient. The three analgesic steps, analgesic ladder, have limitations in the context of longer survival and increasing disease complexity. Therefore, it's advised to introduce advanced treatment options in the treatment plan. So it's accessible to skip the steps when going upwards or to start a higher level and uh, going backwards down as the step ladder rather than just uh, thinking it unidirectional. The starting point is dictated by the needs of an individual patient and the prescribed treatment regime. So there are some patients where early application of the interventional pain techniques are appropriate or we're speak, skipping the next step to start a strong opioids early in the course is uh, more practical and um, accurate for the individual patient. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention. Uh, and uh, I will be answering the questions uh, from the Q&A uh, section. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, the Kular, uh, Prof. Elfan. <laughs> now, uh, the next speaker is uh, Professor Eric Buscher. He is from uh, Switzerland, and uh, I was uh, read he's uh, he's from uh, the Morges. Morges, are you still there, Prof? Yes, I'm still <laughs> yeah. there. Yeah, and uh, you're working uh, in the Pain Management and Neuromodulation Center. Okay. Yeah. Okay, uh, now uh, you may present your, your slide and uh, to talk. Time is yours, sir. Can you see my slides? Not yet, Eric. Not yet. Might so, be on the second, second desktop then. Okay, hang on. Um, it, it's still sunny there. Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. How about this now? We can see the slide. Yes. Okay. Yes, fantastic. Okay. Fantastic. All right. Okay. So, um, good afternoon, I guess, all of you. It's still uh, morning here. Uh, many thanks to Susilo and, and the, the whole team for organizing this meeting despite the adverse conditions. It's always a great pleasure to meet you all, even though it's electronically, this is obviously not my first choice, but uh, well, what, what can you do? What, what I'm going to tell you about today is um, the, the, the spinal cord stimulation for the treatment of both neuropathic and ischemic pain. Now just closely, for my disclosure, um, uh, my department has re received funding from the Swiss National Foundation, the Commission for Technology Innovation, and from Medtronic, but that was uh, a number of years ago. I used to be a speaking and consultancy work for Medtronic. I'm not anymore, and I have no financial uh, com um, uh, commitment with any company. Now, neuromodulation is, is a huge area. Now, we, we are going to kind of concentrate today on just one part of it, which is pain, and pain to treat particularly the neuropathic pain or the vascular pain, which is PVD or angiolog. Now, um, Elvan just uh, showed, uh, 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 gave a very elegant talk, and she mentioned um, the chordotomy. Now, most of you know that we do have two major sensory systems. One is the anterolateral system, which is the system that would conduct, will conduct 
the um, uh, nociceptive pain, and this, uh, which is which is crossed at the level of the spinal cord and goes to the anterior thalamic system, and the other, which is the lemnical system, which is a posterior one, which is uncrossed at the level of the spinal cord, but just crosses at the at the uh, level of the higher spinal cord, and this. Um, system conveys pain, itching, touch, and temperature. Well, although temperature is, is conveyed by the spinal thalamic system to some extent as well. Now, this is the target for spinal cord stimulation. What we do is implant electrodes that you see here um in the posterior aspect of the epidural space and we do stimulate those uh columns the lemnical lemnical system the, the posterior columns that do conduct those um pain information i'm not going to go into the mechanism of the uh of spinal cord simulation action because it is not entirely uh, elucidated now, and to, to the largest extent, it is beyond the practical uh, um, issues that we, we should discuss here. This is the positioning of a patient before you do it. You, you will do that under C-arm to make sure that your electrode are uh, positioned in a proper position, uh, in a proper area. Now, what is the proper area? If this is the area of pain, for instance, now you do have to position your electrodes so that you cover the area of pain. And there is a dogma, which to some extent is not true anymore, but uh, the dogma says that if you do not have a par paresthesia coverage, well, you, you, you won't get pain relief. Now, this is not entirely true anymore, and I'll show you a few examples of that, but basically, the idea is still that if you do spinal cord simulation, you should actually uh, position your electrodes so that you do cover, if not all, at least most of the area of pain. Now, how effective is spinal cord simulation? Well, the efficacy does vary with the indication. Interestingly enough, the best result is in vascular pain, which is angina pectoris or peripheral vascular disease. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll deal with those at the end of my talk. CRPS is another um, complex region of pain syndrome is another good indication. So is polyneuropathy. Now, Elvan just mentioned that uh, spinal cord simulation can be used in patient with cancer pain. Well, this is probably the main indication. Those patients who have persistent pain, either due to the sequelae of a treatment or a, a toxic effect on their spinal or on their um, uh, neural system, this, these are the patients who may benefit from uh, spinal cord stimulation. Usually a patient who has a cancer that is not controlled is, <coughs> is not an indication for spinal cord simulation. It's much, it, it relates much more to what uh, Elvan has uh, discussed previously. And finally, failed back surgery syndrome, which is the most frequent um, indication, although it is to, uh, regrettably not the, uh, the, these are not the best results. Now, what, what are the results? First of all, you should realize that about 25 to 35% of the patients will not respond to stimulation, even though they do have a good uh, indication. This is a very old study, but I'm showing it to you because what it, what it says, the conclusions are very close to what we have today, which means that if you do it, look at those patients who do respond to stimulation, which is about 
75%. You know, some, <coughs> some study it's a bit higher, 80, 85%, but nevertheless, it's, it's, not, it, it's, it's a relatively small group of patients. Um, well, if you look four, four years later, about 50% of those patients will still have at least 50% pain relief. Now, again, this is a very old study, and in, in earlier study, the results have been a little bit better, but not in, in, to some extent in some debatable ways. Now, one of the obvious questions is uh, whether spinal cord stimulation is more effective than reoperation. And here is a study where patients were randomized to either have a second operation or spinal cord stimulation after they failed a first operation. And what that study shows is that patients choose to cross over to the other treatment after six months. And 20% of patients who were randomized to spinal cord stimulation elicited to go to surgery while more than half of the patients who had surgery, uh, a second surgery, wanted to go back to spinal cord stimulation. And what it also shows that if you look three years later, the patients who have spinal cord stimulation did much better in terms of pain relief than those who had reoperation. If you look at opiate consumption, which is, this is increased opiate consum consumption, well, you see that those who were uh, operated increased by nearly 70% of the patients did increase, only 13% of those who had spinal cord stimulation. So the conclusion of that is yes, spinal cord stimulation is certainly more effective than reoperation. Now, how about compare it to medical management? But here again, this is an old study. Uh, but it's a, a fairly good study where randomiz randomization was made to medical management or conventional medical management plus spinal cord stimulation. To cut the long story short, here is the outcome at six months. And you see that only 9% of the patients who had a medical management did actually improve. And the improvement was more than 50%. Well, more than 50% of the patients, or a bit less than 50% of the patients, had actually a significant improvement with um, spinal cord stimulation. Now, I told you, this, these are all studies. Here is a much more recent study that been, you, uh, that's been published in um, um, uh, anesthesia, uh, yeah, anesthesiology, I think. Um, and that was uh, using a new system. The problem with this study, we see the, 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 the pain decreased substantially, and this is low back pain. The, 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 the dark green here is with that new system that used a very high frequency compared with the system that used spinal cord, conventional spinal cord simulation. So the, the improvement is pretty good in both cases, but better in conventional simulation. The problem with this study is that it was uh, sponsored by the company who produced the 10 kilohertz stimulation. If you compare that to what, what came out of a university setting, and that was published by Jose de Enves two years later, and you see, using the same system, 10 kilohertz or conventional spinal cord stimulation, they showed actually that the difference was non-existent. Admittedly, the study was, were, had less patients compared to the um, industry-sponsored one. But I'm not going to into the detail of that. One of the main points was that the blinding of the patient. This is all perspective and, and, and randomized blinded, supposedly. Um, the blinding in this study was much better than in, those, in, in that one. 
the, 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 uh, there was no, the observers that were partially uh, employees of the company were not blinded. So again, the, the newer system, the new technology helps to uh, get better results, but you have to be very careful to see who is publishing it and who's paying for the study. Now, this is again a, 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 a relatively old study, but what it shows that <clears throat> spinal cord stimulation is cost effective. And, and this has been shown over and over again, uh, regardless of which system you use. <coughs> Between one and a half and five years, uh, you, you get a, um, uh, a cost effectiveness or cost neutrality with this uh, uh, therapy. Now, going to neuropathic pain, spin, uh, CRPS is, is a good example. The com complex regional pain syndrome is not notoriously difficult to treat. This is a landmark study that was published by a Dutch group that looked at 54 patients that were randomized either to spinal cord stimulation and physical therapy or physical therapy alone. They looked at the results six months, two years, and five years later, and I'll show you the details of that. Looked at pain, function, quality of life, and global perceived effect. Now, if you look at six months, this, these are pain scores. The pink is physical therapy alone, the red is spinal cord simulation and physical therapy. And you see that at baseline, at the start of therapy, there was the same. One month later, there was <coughs> a significant benefit for patients who had a spinal cord simulation. Now, this was an intention to treat study, which means that in those red bars, you do have a number of patients who actually did not get a stimulator, either because they failed the test or it couldn't be implanted for some reason. That's six months. So it was very promising, an average improvement of 40% in nearly 60% 60 of the patients who responded. Now, with this result, the New England Journal of Medicine, where the paper was published uh, first, uh, requested a uh, follow-up study looking at the result at five years. Now, remember the design was made to six months. Nevertheless, the authors looked at five years and you see one year it's still effective, two years it's still effective and you lose the efficacy at three, four and five years. So the conclusion is um, spinal cord stimulation uh, is effective to relieve pain in CRPS, uh, but it is limited to three years. The problem with that is that that's what the data show, but the critic will remember only that spinal cord simulation does not work. And what the payers understand is CRPS is not cost effective, therefore do not fund it. Now, I should strongly suggest that you go to uh, regional anesthesia and pain medicine where Daniel Carr, published a very good paper, the, the title of which was When Bad Evidence Happens to Good Treatment. And this is a very enlightened a critic of the fallacy of evidence-based medicine. And you know, if you look at the results in a different way, you go back and look at five years. Now, you look at whether, how many of those patients uh, who improve belong to either group. Now patients who improved 60%, 55% of those had some spinal cord simulation and only 23% of patients had with, with uh, physical therapy alone. Uh, the ones who worsened, predominantly patients who had only physical therapy and changed, it was practically similar. And if you ask the patient what you did again, 95% of implanted patients said, certainly I would have the treatment again. So 
depending on how you look at the, um, the, the result of the treatment, the conclusion may significantly vary. For those who are interested, I mean, NICE, the NICE guidance of 2008 uh, has, uh, um, has acknowledged the efficacy of spinal cord stimulation for um, neuropathic and ischemic pain under the conditions that the, the, the patients were having severe and unrelieved patient, uh, pain with conventional management. Now, another neuropathic pain is painful diabetic neuropathy. Now, in painful di diabetic neuropathy, patients do experience, experience peak pain and background pain. And this is just a first glimpse <clears throat> at what can happen. Here is the, it's a small number of patients, it's about 10 patients, but it's an initial observation. This is the peak VIS with the stimulation off. When you turn it on, the, the pain decreases. And this is a result 3.3 years later. Now, if you, if you look, do the same measurement for the background pain, this is stimulation off and this is stimulation on. 7.5 7, 7 years later, peak pain still high, without the stimulation and much better on. Same thing with the background pain. Though this is a suggestion that clearly uh, spinal cord stimulation does have an efficacy in, in um, painful diabetic neuropathy. Since then, a number of good studies, randomized control studies have shown that um, the quality of life improved significantly here uh, this is the vast score uh, that you, you see decreases uh, significantly in those patients here in the dark lines with, um, that have uh, spinal cord stimulation compared to control. And if you look at the quality of life, <clears throat> same thing, it, it's much better with um, spinal cord stimulation. Another study here looked at um, the um, the daytime pain intensity that decreased here very significantly and the quality of life increased similarly. And this is up to 36 months. So uh, I'm not going to go into all those studies, but yes, uh, spinal cord simulation clearly uh, has a, a potential to treat the painful diabetic neuropathy that's unrelieved with conventional medication. Ischemic pain. Well, you look either at peripheral vascular disease or at chronic refractory angina. Um, first, here is just a, 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 an image, it's a, thermo, a thermography image of what happens when you stimulate the uh, dorsal, dorsal column. This is before the, 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 before the stimulation on your left. And as the stimulation goes on, you see that there is a, an increase in the, um, the peripheral uh, vasodilatation, the microcirculation, same thing in the hands. So again, I'm not, I, I don't have the time to go into the details of that, but when you, when you do have an effect of that importance, clearly uh, the question is, and this was the initial enthusiasm of it, can we prevent amputation? Now, in order to see whether we can or not, uh, there are three groups uh, of, of, of patients you can start with. And you look at transcutaneous oxygen concentration, which is if, you, if it's below 30 millimeters of the mercury, um, after stimulation, it should increase more than 20 millimeters of mercury. Paresthesia coverage should be at least 75%. And appropriate uh, spinal cord stimulation should relieve pain, which it does in the vast majority of patients. Now, you either match those criteria or you don't. 
and here is the result. If you do match the uh, criteria, the major the potential of the major amputation drops significantly. If you do not match them or uh, partially match them, there is no difference. So clearly, uh, you decrease uh, the um, tissue loss. It's not entirely the amputation, but in order, instead of cutting the leg below the knee, you may just uh, have half of the foot that, that goes. Now, as uh, my time slowly goes up, I'm just going to show you a very uh, short, I uh, know uh, a number of slides on the, uh, the angina. Physiologically, if you do, if you have uh, a, a patient with cardiac um, uh, ischemic disease, when you increase the workload, chest pains appear, ischemia, ST depression, lactate production. So you stop it and you start the stimulation. And if you, if you increase again the, the, uh, the workload here, this is, you come to the same, same point, but no chest pain, no ischemia, and no ST depression. If you, can, if you carry on, you do get the same picture that you get initially. So in other words, you do change the way the heart um, distributes and uses oxygen. Incidentally, what you also get is a prevention of severe uh, arrhythmia uh, if you do the stimulation, but this is not a, this is not a, just a, a, a laboratory preclinical study in, in dogs. So this is the position of the, uh, the electrodes, usually T1. And the obvious question is, does, is it better than than uh, cabbage, uh, um, coronary artery bypass grafting. Well, this is a very, this is a fantastic study that was not, it's not uh, very well advertised, but it's been published in 2000, 1998. They compared patients who undergone cabbage with uh, not proven prognostic benefit from cabbage. I mean, this is the, more than 50% of the patients who undergo this operation are in this category. Increased surgical risk, the redos, et cetera, et cetera. And they looked at the results between the two treatments. Now, without going into the details, if you look at symptoms control, nitrate consum consumptions, weak doses, et cetera, no difference between cabbage and spinal cord stimulation. Angina attacks per week, no difference between the two groups. Self-assessment satisfaction, no difference between the two groups. If you look at maybe, you know, those patients who were not operated did, did uh, die earlier. The answer is no. The mortality was 4.8 years in, in about 30% of the cases. No difference between cabbage and spinal cord stimulation. Quality of life, no difference again. Uh, and and uh, the conclusion really is that cabbage and spinal cord stimulation are comparable in high-risk patients, except that there, in, in those groups, there was one patient who died, uh, but after the, um, uh, the, the bypass um, procedure. So again, criteria for uh, SCS. I'm not going to go the whole thing, but uh, you know, clearly you have to choose your patients appropriately. Now, the psychological issue is one of the major problems, and and this is not this is not enough. You see, it's a bit more complicated than that. Having said that, there is no psychological testing that will predict the outcome. And, and uh, this has been observed by Rick North in 1996 already. So what you have to concentrate on is this. You, you can't expect your psychologist to give you the right answer. I mean, uh, you know, patients who do not fit in the, in, in, in the mold. 
what this shows is you must include, exclude patients who probably are bad candidates. Now, it's either green light, uh, which would be, you know, you go ahead with treatment, that's fine. Or it's a red light. Uh, there is a major psychological unresolved issue, so don't do it. Anything in between is uh, you proceed with the treatment, but psychological sessions pre or post intervention are needed. So you do both. And if you, uh, there is a, a publication by, by Simon Thompson in the EGP that is a, a tool that helps you to select uh, those patients for chronic pain. So in conclusion, spinal cord simulation um, is effective in neuropathic and ischemic pain. And compared to best medical treatment, it is uh, uh, effective in feedback, in uh, CRISP, in diabetic neuropathy, in chronic angina, in peripheral vascular disease for pain improve the quality of life. Cost effective is well established for, fa for failed back and CRIPS. And it's a little bit sh more shaky, but, but this is because we don't have the data for um, diabet and, uh, diabetic polyneuropathy. It may prevent a major amputation, but again, the study we have are relatively limited. Complications can, can occur up to 40% of the cases, but it's more, it's, it's usually hard work. It's common, it's more common than biological and can be fixed um, non-invasively. Serious neurological damage do occur, but they're extremely rare. And um, uh, there are only a few uh, publications. So the conclusion really is that Spinal cord stimulation is safe, effective, and reversible. And with that, I leave you with this view, which is not exactly what I see from my window now, but this is the sun going down on the Alps in Switzerland. And I thank you for your attention. Wow. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Pro Professor Eric. Uh, it was a very wonderful presentation and uh, open our insight because uh, no no, uh, not so many as, as, as here in Indonesia because of the price. And uh, uh, now you, you may uh, look yeah. at the question at the Q&A while I, I will have discussion. I think uh, I will start with the, uh, okay, we will start from Prof. Elfan. Uh, you did answer some, I think two question already, uh, answer, but uh, you may explain uh, yeah. orally. Okay, thank you. Okay. okay. Uh, one of the questions was using transdermal fentanyl. As yeah. I uh, answered in the Q and A section, we use transdermal fentanyl for patients with uh, who cannot swallow, like esophagus cancer, or very have very uh, severe nausea and vomiting because of the um, disease or uh, adjuvant therapies like chemotherapy. And uh, for patients uh, with uh, kidney disease, because of the metabolism, the advantages of the metabolism of the fentanyl, and also some liver dysfunction. But it should be uh, considered, it should, uh, I should also um, uh, make a point that this uh, transdermal fentanyl should not be used as a step two drug uh, and shouldn't be used in opioid nerve patients and shouldn't be used during the titration period. Uh, but it has some uh, very important advantages compared to morphine, considering the side effects, including constipation, sedation, and nausea and vomiting. And another question was any risk of infection for intraspinal anesthesia yeah. and how we re administer uh, this procedure? Well, depending on the life expectancy, an epidural catheter tunneled or epidural port can be placed because we know that uh, compared to the oral road, uh, one, uh, we need uh, less than uh, 20 times um, less uh, epidural morphine compared to it. For example, a person is uh, can't have uh, analgesia till uh, 100 uh, milligrams of morphine, can have 
uh, sufficient analgesia with five milligrams um, epidurally administered morphine or less than one milligram intrathecal administered. Well, considering the infection rates, they are uh, can be similar, but for epidural catheters, we can have um, if, uh, the uh, fibromas, uh, the occlusion of the catheter. And since we uh, have an impatient uh, clinic as well, we always uh, follow up these patients uh, very closely. Uh, we uh, always uh, see them every day, the catheter, the placement, any risk of infection, any uh, difference in the skin or um, uh, pain during the uh, catheter tunneling. So it's very important uh, for uh, to um, keep in mind the risks of the infection, especially for those patients who are very immunocompromised. Okay. Uh, I, I want to uh, further ask about the epidural to put inside the uh, intrathecal. Uh, yeah. Is that uh, safe? I mean, uh, when you insert that? <laughs> Uh -huh. Well, what uh, is the level uh, of your intention? Okay. Uh, well, uh, uh, for pr uh, for practical reasons and uh, for uh, the risk of uh, not only infection but other uh, risks, we usually pre uh, uh, perform epidural catheters first. In tracheal drug delivery, although I, you can see my slides, there are some pumps uh, for tracheal drug delivery. Uh, because of the economic status of our country, uh, they are not. Uh, they are only uh, they are only scheduled for people spasticity for baclofen pumps. Baclofen, yes. Yeah, for baclofen pumps. So uh, in previous years, we could uh, have the advantage of performing those uh, pumps, intratecal pumps, to very uh, to patients with long life uh, expectancy. But uh, for now, uh, we we could only uh, perform epidural catheters or ports. Another option is continuous uh, intrathecal catheter, but because of the you know, risk of infection, yeah. uh, misplacement, or inadvert uh, un uh, unwanted uh, drug injection, yeah. <laughs> uh, the, uh, it's yeah. very very uh, critical. So uh, we always educate our patients uh, within uh, when they are in hospitalized. Uh, we always uh, explain them how to prepare, how to make uh, everyday uh, evaluation. So it's very critical. Uh, to answer your questions, the epidural route will be preferable um, for most of the patients. Okay, but uh, we, we must do it uh, tunneling. To, re to, re to reduce yeah, the risk yeah. of infection. Uh, the tunneling enables uh, you to uh, keep it a longer time. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it uh, lessens the risk of misplacement because yes. it's very common and also uh, may uh, be a barrier to the infection. Yes. And also it's more comfortable because it's very hard for the patient mm -hmm. to have a catheter just on the back. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, when it's tunneled, mm -hmm. it's more practical to perform the injection and uh, also to be uh, more comfortable when lying uh, on the bed. So you put the uh, tunneling uh, to the yeah. side of the back. I mean, uh, not yeah. on the back, but uh, to the front. Uh, just, lateral, uh, just lateral coming uh, anteriorly uh, mm -hmm. so that uh, it's very uh, comfortable for the patient as well as the one who is making the epidural injections because sometimes those patients are very yeah. uh, always lying on the bed uh, very hardly moving so it's very important to be make choices more practical yeah thank you very much and also the the the, the question about the how, how you monitor your pain uh, regimen for yeah. the cancer patient. This yeah. is a very common, but uh, yeah, it's very yeah. important. 
Yeah. Well, uh, I think the first, as I wrote, uh, wrote in the Q&A section, the first thing that we all pain specialists should do is give enough time for the patient and the family, because education is the most important thing. Uh, when uh, most of our patients, when they hear that a morphine is started, uh, they, uh, they think that it's the end of life no, uh, it's impossible to be cured. So uh, you should uh, explain everything in detail and monitor the efficacy, the side effects, and all the concurrent uh, problems like appetite, uh, nausea, vomiting, all of these side effects, the sleep, the depression, the anxiety. So uh, we uh, try to uh, see our patients or their uh, family members Every, uh, almost every two weeks, so that we can uh, we can understand the uh, pain severity, the side effects, the quality of life, and unwanted uh, side effects. And it's very important because uh, to monitor uh, monitoring is something that you're working with a patient uh, who is diseases progressive. So uh, in every visit, you can see another uh, source of pain. And it can be a metastasis, or it can be another site of uh, pain. It can be cancer-related, cancer treatment-related. For example, a lung cancer, a patient has a post-surgical pain, post pain, but may have a pain because of the recurrence. So it's very important to work in a multidisciplinary group so that uh, we uh, are in close connection with our radiologists, uh, oncologists, and uh, the ones uh, for radiotherapy. So it's a multidisciplinary uh, team uh, that should be uh, monitoring the patient. Okay, testicular, Professor <laughs> <laughs> Okay, now, uh, Prof. Eric, will you answer uh, questions from the Q&A part? It's, yes. Uh, yeah, okay. Well, <clears throat> obviously, uh, spinal cord stimulation is expensive. No question about that. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> now, you know, the, the expense has to be, and, and this varies very much from one country to the next. Yes. So I cannot pontificate on what's happening in, in, um, in Indonesia. What I'm trying to say is that uh, in most countries where this has been um, studied, if you compare the cost of the multiple visits, the cost of the loss of work, the cost of the drugs, and you add all that, uh, the, despite the high, the high initial cost, spinal cord stimulation is cost effective within two, three years. I mean, that's what the data yeah. shows. And again, it may be different in Indonesia. I, I do not know that. But the drugs like pregabalin are certainly not very, very cheap in Indonesia either nor uh, the opiates, besides the fact that neither pregabalin nor the opiates do the trick in situations like uh, feedback surgery or creeps or whatever. Yeah. Uh, Prof. Eric, before, before pandemic, uh, some of our patients who need uh, to spinal cord stimulation went to uh, abroad to got the spicy S. I mean, they, they went to Singapore and one of my patients went to Switzerland also. Oh. <laughs> yeah, but I, I forget where, where uh, she was. <laughs> okay, the, uh, another question maybe regarding the migration of the uh, lead. Well, the migration, I, I, I answered that. You know, yeah. it's true that migration is something that was very common with the older systems. Now, uh, it, it has not been a significant problem lately, and, and there are two reasons for that. Mm -hmm. First of all, the, um, the, the equipment, the technology has improved, particularly how we anchor the electrodes. Second, um, the initially the electrodes were only having four contacts. Today, you have uh, eight contacts and maybe 16 contacts, depending on what you do and how many electrodes you put in, which manufacturer you choose. So even if the electrodes moves a little bit, um, it is not a problem because you can reprogram the device without having to 
go back and change and modify the, the, the electrodes. So this is not anymore a significant clinical problem. Sorry, Prof. Eric, if it migrate? Uh, if it does migrate, yeah. um, what it means that, uh, let's assume the, <coughs> the electrodes mm -hmm. goes up a yeah. centimeter, okay? okay? Now, if you do choose your, your target with the, the ideal stimulation in the middle of the electrode, mm -hmm. you just shift the program okay. of the electrodes up or down, and you okay. recuperate what you had before. And again, oh, okay. we used to have to go back and reoperate, change the electrodes and move the electrodes mm -hmm. around. Mm -hmm. and I have not done that for the last 10 years oh, okay. because the anchoring is better and because we have more options to program the electrode. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, that's very nice. Uh, yeah, because sometimes uh, uh, patients from abroad that got the SCS before and came to us and asked us to... <laughs> To reposition, but we cannot do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, you're right. You're yeah. right. But I mean, if they if they do have octopolar yeah. electrodes, yeah. Uh, usually you 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 might be able to get away with reprogramming. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, how about the the question about the uh, another drug after the SCS implantation or? Uh, yeah. Well, you see, this is this is a very good question. Now. Uh, it clearly depends on the indication, okay? Uh, patients with neuropathic pain, uh, whether it is uh, um, diabetic or it is ischemic, they usually get away with their drugs. They decrease at least substantially. Now for, for those who had spinal surgery, it's a bit different, but it, it very much depends on the country and the, and the in the habits that are in this country. In the US, for instance, they prescribe lots of opiates and they mm -hmm. have a hard time to get off the opiates. Mm -hmm. We don't do that that much in Europe. Um, so the conditions are different. Now, there is one thing you have to remember. Spinal cord stimulation, you use it because you want the patient to be more comfortable. You want yes. the patient the pain to go down. You don't do that because you want the drug off. Mm -hmm. You want the patient more comfortable. The drugs is a problem that you look at after that. Some may, some won't. Mm -hmm. But if the patient is more comfortable, more active, goes back to work, etc., then you've won. You've won the uh, the battle. Okay. Thank you very much, Prof. Eric. Uh, Prof. Erfan. Uh, do you have uh, your patient with uh, spinal cord stimulation over there in Turkey? Well, uh, we have spinal cord stimulation in Turkey, but only for uh, non-cancer patients. Non-cancer patients. Yeah. Uh, and uh, to uh, before implantation, uh, there are very strict rules uh, in our, with, uh, in our uh, protocols. Uh, the uh, psychiatry department, the physical therapy department, and neurosurgery department should all see the patient and should all, all, uh, all together uh, should give a con uh, consent, uh, uh, co should confirm uh, the application of the system to the patient. We, uh, because uh, sometimes the, because of the multidimensional of pain, the biopsychosocial components yeah. of pain, uh, sometimes psychiatry department first wants to make a try about their uh, specific uh, treatments for especially depressive and uh, anxiety uh, for patients with depression and anxiety. And they also screen the patients very carefully so that uh, after the trial and uh, after the trial period, sometimes we also consult them with the patient before placing a, a permanent system. And uh, we also use this, uh, especially for, as uh, Eric said, 
for um, neuropathic pain for Crips patients, especially a, a large group of patients is pale back surgery patients. We also had some patients with uh, uh, burger disease like ischemia. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have any uh, experience with the uh, cardio, uh, cardiac uh, patients uh, in our uh, department, but we also uh, we all have gained uh, uh, enough experience about the neuropathic uh, pain patients. But unfortunately, um, uh, according to our, our government guidelines, uh, the pa patient should not be immunocompromised or uh, a uh, have a cancer diagnosis for our uh, procedure to be uh, for, for this device uh, to be implemented to the patient. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Pan. Uh -huh. Professor Eric, uh, can I ask you uh, one? I mean, this is not a question, but uh, any su suggestion for, from you to us in Indonesia how to improve, uh, how to uh, start to use the spinal cord stimulation? Any su suggestion, maybe? <laughs> Um, well, <clears throat> the, the, the answer is obviously, I, I, I don't, I don't really know, but, but, um, you know, one, one, uh, way that at least worked for us is to start in a very controlled way and a controlled way could be a clinical study. Mm -hmm. Now, if you if you can uh, uh, have a cooperation with a manufacturer uh, and have either a local or a multi-center study, uh, I think that is something that allows both our view in your referral physicians and all the rest of the people around the technology to get more familiar and to get a sense of the benefits you can get. So my, my, my suggestion would be uh, let the, try to go towards a, a, a clinical study. I'm not, I'm not talking about basic research, you understand, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I looking know, about, I know, yeah. I'm talking about something that's an observation, observational study mm -hmm. uh, that you could share with, with another group. And if you're interested, we can talk about that yeah. uh, in, 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 in a perspective that is um, eventually helping the local uh, okay. area. Thank you very much. That was uh, that is a very good uh, suggestion. Any any comment from you, uh, Professor Elfan? Well, uh, uh, I'm very happy to see that there are more than 400 attendees uh, for this panel, uh, as it was uh, the same as uh, last year. Uh, it's so uh, it, uh, being on site is so uh, wonderful being in your country but uh, although because of the situation we're having worldwide uh, it's very important uh, to uh, still uh, go on with indo anesthesia meetings and uh, to have you all uh, within this uh, it's very important because as i as far as i can see there are so many attendees and uh, we're uh, worldwide in all continents. Uh, so it's a great pleasure and honor to be a part of this meeting. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. That was a very good work of Dr. Susilo Chandra, I mean, and uh, all the Indo Anesthesia team. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Elfan Erhan and Professor Eric Boucher. Uh, and uh, I give back to Dr. Krisha. Thank you very much. Good afternoon or good morning. <laughs> Thank you. Good, Good morning for Professor Elhan. <laughs> and thank you very much, Dr. Pancha, for leading the discussion. Thank you, Eric and Elfan. Uh, very nice presentations, very clear. Uh, very good to see you. Hopefully, uh, next year, who knows, we can see each other. In, yeah, uh, we all hope so. <laughs> yeah, that's true, that's true, that's true. And I would like to thank all participants, uh, all the panelists who are still here. I think we have Dr. Jenica here with us. Dr. Jenica, you want to give some comments uh, for the presentations? 
Yeah, thank you very much, Shatu. I had tried to log in as a normal, a usual participant, but now I get the opportunity to once again <laughs> thank you for, for this. It's fantastic. I, I know that in Indonesia, you are probably not that interested in the Winter Olympics, but I would think that in Switzerland and in Norway, we are very keen and you are competing with the Winter Olympic Games for us. But yes, it has been a pleasure and, and so inspiring to, to uh, give priority uh, to this and to the, to the sporting competitions. And, and just uh, what, what uh, Elvan said, that you are able to have all people from all over the world gather at the same time. So it's almost a little bit like traveling. And what uh, I wrote in a, another WhatsApp group, uh, what makes this very special uh, uh, in addition to the to the all the good talks and so is that you are actually able to put a social program into a virtual meeting and I used a hashtag life is more than work for the music sessions that we are having so we can dance we can enjoy music we can enjoy friendship and sharing smiles as I can see and learning more uh, in our professional lives as well. So thank you very much. I can't wait until next weekend. <laughs> thank you, Dan. Thank Thanks you very much. much. Yes. Thank you, thank you, thank, thank you. you.